I have been a hunter since a very young age, a wanderer of the silent woods, a stalker of the croaking marshes, a drifter of the sighing deserts. My father was a hunter, as was his father. I would say it runs in our blood, but I think it runs through all of us. Some have just let it crawl into the darkest corners of themselves, where it sits and longs for the feeling of dirt and wind and snow. It's the primal part of us that exists despite the nine-to-five slog, the grocery stores we patronize, and the concrete forests we call home. We make enough money to provide for our family and to send the kids to football practice. But something has been lost. We long for a struggle that tests our fortitude. The rewards of the endeavor are redemptive, yet like a rat in a trap. People don't know how to release themselves and be truly free. The shackles of modern living are strong, but there is a key. Stepping outside the safety and security we understand and challenging the natural world that we lost acquaintance with so long ago. I am grateful for my father who introduced me to the harsh beauty of the world. It made me strong, self-reliant, liberated, enlightened. I remember walking through the cornfields of South Dakota with him, dry corn stalks whipping across my face, squinting against the lashing onslaught. We were hunting pheasants, and I wasn't old enough to hunt yet. I could barely see over the tops of the stalks. The hunters walked ten yards apart down the corn rows, pushing the pheasants out in front of them. The bitter wind howled in an attempt to mask the explosion of wings, and the pheasants took flight. They erupted seemingly from nowhere. It was always in that moment of flight when they were backlit, against the feeble sun where everything ceased to exist. Life's greatest and most troubling questions were brushed from my mind as the pheasant burst forth from the earth. The male's streaming tail feathers and colorful plumage popped in contrast to the gray sky. I swear I could even see the yellow iris and pupil that seemed fixed on me alone. If the call of rooster from a nearby hunter didn't slam me back to earth, the crack of the shotgun would. In another moment of time as frozen as the landscape around me, the bird's upward momentum halted, and the birds fell. The corn stalks reclaimed what they had lost to the sky. My brain once again registered my surroundings, and I cheered with those around me, and the hunter picked up the bird. For one last moment, the yellow iris stared at me, before disappearing into a game bag, taken from the land. I learned a lot from my father about hunting. He taught me about animal behavior, tracking, the weather, and terrain. The more you understand an animal, the more successful the hunt. In Southern California, we hunted quail in cold woods, where we yearned for the sun to break over the tops of the mountains that were black like pitch. As we walked through the dry grass, I was self-conscious of the crunch of vegetation under my feet and the snap of branches that cut through the air. The air itself seemed disapproving of the blundering noise we created. As we walked, we would occasionally stop and listen for their distinctive call that would guide us to them. Silence was their savior, and their calls were a beacon to us. We would share a glance and eagerly quicken our pace to catch our quarry and just where we expected them to be. They materialized, their camouflage so complex that it was as if the ground itself was fragmenting and scattering in every direction. As we pursued them, my father would hold out a hand and I would stop. The silence was so complete that I would breathe through my mouth to avoid the chill air whistling through my nostrils. My heart skipped when a quail flew from the brush and beelined for safety, and as I struggled with my cold wooden thumb to get my safety off, my father had dropped the quail with a single shot. The silence, punctuated by the shotgun blast, was replaced by the ringing in my ears. As he retrieved the bird, I asked him what he had stopped me for. He said that the silence and unknown bring more fear than what is seen and heard. The brain can process a direction to flee when danger presents itself. But when the danger is unseen and unheard, it creates a panic. 
This panic drives the birds to flight when its camouflage would easily conceal its presence from us. As hunters, we are always trying to exploit a weakness in our prey, leveraging their natural instincts such as the drive to eat, drink, and mate to our advantage. When hunting predators such as coyotes, the sound of a dying rabbit playing over a speaker was irresistible to them. To add to the illusion, we would place a mechanical box in the middle of a field with a wire running from it to a furry object with a tail. The mechanical box had a motor that would whip the wire from side to side, giving the appearance that a panicked furry creature was injured and thrashing around. The screams and thrashing brought out a compulsion that the coyote could not suppress. Coyotes would come running towards the decoy at a dead sprint, and by the time they realized what had happened, it was too late. A 223 vomit round put them down quick. We used calls for other animals, too, from the massive moose that glided through the snow and trees like wraiths, to the ducks that dove from the sky to land on misty ponds. But calling isn't as easy as blowing on an instrument. There is technique required, utilizing a specific pitch, pattern, or sound in order to create the desired effect. Every call meant something different from feeding, mating, fighting, and warning. If the wrong call was used at the wrong time or with an improper technique, it could spook the prey. There were many times where I attempted to call an animal only to have it turn tail and flee in the opposite direction of me. An effective call could mean the difference between a successful and unsuccessful hunt. Every game animal required a different set of skills and techniques in order to successfully hunt them. Part of the thrill of hunting is becoming a master of every style and the continual process of self-improvement. What I hunt varies from year to year. Depending on how busy I am during the season, I can sometimes travel out of states, but often due to work, I stay local and hunt within a few hours of my house. It was early on in the duck season, and I had gone to a local honey hole that many people were not aware of. I rarely saw other hunters in this area, so it was a good opportunity for me to walk through the marsh and by the river in silence and solitude. On this particular morning, I pulled up to the dirt patch on the side of the road where I parked my truck and shut off the engine. I got out and was greeted by a chill, moist air. I was within a couple miles of the ocean, so the air was always somewhat damp and salty. The river and marsh were briny, and the level of the water was impacted by the tides as they rose and fell. I shut the door, leaving the warm truck cab behind me. I started to walk down the dirt path that paralleled the marsh and river. I enjoyed the walk, even in the off-season. I would come here and walk to enjoy the cool air and the smell of salt the cry of the local fauna, and the rising of the sun that brought the promise of a new day. Even on a slow hunting day, there was still a lot to enjoy. There was a kingfisher that would perch high in the trees, his bright blue body like an orb of water pulled from the river, purified of mud and silt. The sentry scanned the water with his keen eyesight. Then, when he spotted his prey, he dove from the tree, tucking his wings to his side as he pierced the surface of the water. He would emerge with a sparkling of water that was caught by the weak dawn light. Shimmering, like the scattered drops of water, was the small fish that was speared upon his pointed beak. He would return to his branch to consume his meal. There were ospreys that dove for fish in the river as well. Gulls and cormorants began their exodus from the coast to inland waters to feed. Vultures like torn black rags circled above. I even saw a seal swimming down the river, presumably heading back to sea. A stoic great blue heron stood in the middle of the river, absolutely motionless. The slender bird deftly maneuvered his way through the muck and reeds with his skeletal legs, head bobbing and cocked to gaze into the water. I observed the lord of the river, his stature creating a commanding presence. As I approached, the stilt walker clumsily took to the air with a croak that belied his majesty. I continued my walk. I looked down at my gun, 
It was a 12-gauge, under-over Browning. No polymer like the newer shotguns. Just wood and metal, with intricate engravings in the metal. I broke open the barrel and inserted two three-inch shells, snapping it shut. The sky was lightening, and I gazed downriver. It was hard to tell due to the light, but there seemed to be some ducks out in the water about a hundred yards from me. I crouched down and slowly moved towards the bobbing black blobs on the surface of the river. I used the bushes to my advantage as I stalked closer. When I thought I was close enough, I burst forth from the bushes, and my quarry took flight. A quick evaluation of the flight pattern and body structure told me it was a duck. I raised my firearm, looked down the length of the barrel, and led the flying bird with the bead. I made sure to smoothly track the bird, took a deep breath, squeezed the trigger, and continued to follow through after the shot. The duck's wings promptly folded, and it plummeted to the water. I ejected the spent shell, and gun smoke filled the air and my nostrils. I was wearing chest-high waders so that I could remain dry while retrieving the ducks from the water. The first couple feet were always the worst. The mud would sink me up to my knees for the first few steps, threatening to apprehend me. But once in the deeper water, the river bottom became firm. I reached my prize and picked it up from the water. I gasped. It was one of the most beautiful ducks I had ever seen. The majority of the front of its body and chest were covered in white plumage. It had a shiny black stripe that started at the base of its neck and traveled to the tip of its tail. But what was most beautiful was its head. Towards the top of its head was a white spot like a cotton ball. At first, I thought the area of the head surrounding the white spot was black. Upon further inspection, I realized that As the rising sun struck the feathers, they turned an iridescent purple into green. I pondered the implications of this color scheme and wondered about its evolutionary benefits in the continual survival and propagation of the species. And then I realized that it didn't matter. Reducing the beauty of this creature to blind evolution seems to be a disservice to its creation. It was a masterpiece that I could not take for granted. I decided to call it early and placed the warm body inside my vest as I made the walk back to my truck. I got home twenty minutes later and my grandma greeted me as I came through the front door. My grandfather had been a hunter too, that is, until he had his stroke fifteen years ago. He had a hard time getting around and so he had been giving away his hunting rifles and shotguns over the years. He was eighty now and when it rains it pours. He had many health issues, and he had moved back with my parents so that they could help take care of him as it became increasingly more difficult for him to take care of himself. But despite his circumstances in life, he was a man of faith, and I admired him so much for that. I attempted to live with the same faith that brought him peace and joy even as his health faded. He saw everything as a blessing, even the tragedies. He saw beauty everywhere. That's when he noticed the duck. He couldn't see very well, so he asked me to bring it closer to him. I approached his wheelchair and held the duck up closer for him to see. He peered through his enormously thick glasses at it and stared for a moment. Then he looked up at me and said it was the most beautiful black and white duck he had ever seen. He told me I should take the duck to a taxidermist to immortalize its beauty. I told him that I would. He passed away two weeks later. While his death was tragic, we were able to reflect on our fond memories of him, especially the last couple of months that he was with us. Everyone said what needed to be said. He made amends, he found peace, and he saw the beauty of life. Winter's grasp was creeping across the land, and for me, that meant the hunting season was almost over. I thought I would get my mind off of things and go for an impromptu hunt for Dove out in the desert. I woke up early, around 4.30 on a Saturday morning, and started my two-hour drive towards Bakersfield. I loved early morning drives by myself. I would usually throw on a podcast, listen to some 70s rock, and cruise in the slow lane. I always loved the journey. 
I started to head down the winding grade, and in another hour I was in Bakersfield, as the horizon turned a dusky blue. I turned off the highway and drove through the town until the buildings became fewer and the agricultural fields dominated the land. There were groves of almond trees in this area, and Dove typically used these fields as flyways. Even before I made it to my destination, I saw the flitty flight pattern of morning doves, their dark silhouettes becoming visible. I reached the end of the dirt road and slowly came to a stop. I turned off the engine and the radio followed. I got out and for a few moments just stood and admired the stillness. Soft bird song came from the groove of trees. The dusty air stank of agriculture, making me realize how far from home I was. I decided to set my chair up on the edge of the tree line with my cooler of water, Gatorade, and a gas station cold cut. Now all I had to do was take it in and relax, and also be ready to draw on the drop of a hat if a dove flew by. I settled into a more comfortable position in my chair and watched the skies for some time. The next moment, I awoke with a start. The shotgun on my lap fumbled, and I almost pitched forward out of the folding chair. I let out a strangled yell at the sudden awakening when I hadn't even realized that I had fallen asleep. I took a deep breath and mentally shook it off as my heart rate lowered and my breathing returned to normal. I looked around me. Still no dove flew over the trees. For that matter, uh, nothing was moving. The soft bird song I had heard earlier had ceased. For a moment, I thought the peace had been shattered by my violent awakening, and that's why the hair on the back of my neck stood on end, but something persisted. The adrenaline spike should have ebbed by now, but something lingered. Gut instincts are hard to ignore when you're alone in the woods. I tried to focus my attention on my senses. I realized that I had been straining to hear. At first, I couldn't tell whether I was listening for anything at all, or whether I was listening for something. And that's when I heard it. Well, I couldn't tell what it was yet, but it was certainly a sound. It snaked its way through the groove of trees, slithering across the leaf litter. Despite the now relatively warm air, a chill started at my right ear and traveled down my neck and into my lower back, like someone had whispered in my ear in the dead of night. I looked in the direction that the sound had come from. The trees stood before me. I felt just as rooted as they were. Something kept me from moving forward. My eyes remained fixed on the trees, eyes narrowing. I held my breath, standing on the precipice. Without realizing it, I had taken the first step forward. I moved forward into the silent trees, searching for the source of the sound. I had been walking for several minutes. This silence was not the type that I sought. The ambient noise I had previously taken for granted was now absent. No songbirds, no drone of insects, nothing. The only sound came from me wandering through the loam and leaves but the sound was muffled, suppressed somehow. The same way that snow absorbs sound and it intensifies silence. These trees were suffocating. I got the prickling feeling on the back of my neck again. I whipped around to look over my shoulder back the way I had come. Nothing. As I turned back, I thought I saw movement out of the corner of my eye, and I spun my head around to see nothing but the bemused trees. I looked down at the ground slightly, trying to center myself. I gripped my shotgun tighter and managed to grin grimly. I really had nothing to worry about. I almost laughed. There wasn't much that would be able to withstand two shotgun blasts, even if it was just birdshot. I looked up again and kept walking. I realized the trees were granting a respite. They were beginning to thin, and I felt my tension melt. Then... Through the top of the trees, I saw a flock of birds, the first living thing I'd seen since I had arrived. I only caught a quick glimpse of them, but I wasn't sure that I recognized the species. Before I could stop myself, I quickened my pace to follow their progress to the trees. Something in the back of my mind whispered to stop, but I only increased my pace, 
stumbling over roots and rocks as I tried to keep the birds in sight. I was now running, and I couldn't pull my gaze away. The trees rushed by me, and while my mind was now screaming to slow down, look, and listen, I was hurtling forward in my rabid pursuit. Suddenly, I burst through the edge of the trees and found myself in a clearing. I frantically searched the sky, and I saw them. I realized what they were. It was a flock of black ibis. I stared in sudden silence. They were circling the clearing, and there were hundreds of them. The sight was overwhelming. They beat their wings frantically, like their lives depended on it. Their beaks were agape, and their throats vibrated at an alarming rate. No other sound filled the clearing, except for the beating of their wings. Normally, I would admire animals and their natural habitat, but something about this was wrong. I didn't know what a flock of black ibis could possibly be doing in Bakersfield. Ibis were typically marsh or wading birds and could be found near wetlands. Bakersfield was a damn desert if it weren't for the irrigation that supported agriculture. Something about them wasn't right. They were heralds of dread. I felt as if I was about to completely lose my nerve as I stared up at the circling flock, ceaselessly flapping. That's when I heard it, and I knew that it was the sound that had awoken me on the edge of the tree line. It was a female voice, a soft, silky, smooth, sensual voice. It crept across the clearing, coming from the other side. It came in waves, breaking and retreating, crashing and hissing, ebbing and flowing. I couldn't understand what was being said, but I knew what it meant. The harder I tried to make out the words, the more I let go of the world around me. All that mattered now was the voice. It was ebb, and with each flow I was driven closer. My mind was adrift, and I let it float in warm bliss, floating in a clear, warm sea, waves lapping my body and lulling me into a state of peace. Basking in a green meadow, with grass that caressed my face, I was halfway across the clearing, following the voice. That's when she appeared from behind a tree. She was a tall woman with milky skin, her voice like honey. She had thick, black hair that billowed despite the lack of wind. She wore a white dress that flowered down to her bare feet. Her body swayed and undulated, just like the ebb and flow of her voice. I was mesmerized. I vaguely realized that my gun was back on the other side of the clearing. Her soothing words stopped, as did I, and we both stood, staring at each other across the space left between us as the ibis circled like fabric of the night stitched to the sky. There was a pause, a serene moment. She was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. She smiled at me with warmth that I felt in my chest and it radiated to the rest of my body. Tears filled my eyes as I stared at the radiant woman as the ibis continued their flight. The piece was shattered with the crack of a bone. My eyes widened as the woman's head inclined with a snap, and her mouth split in a smile that stretched from ear to ear. Bones cracked in her fingers and toes as her hands, as her hands and feet lengthened. Her nails grew into thick, darkened claws. I was frozen. Her legs lengthened to spindly stilts with backwards-facing knees, and her arms elongated to her knees. Her previous smooth black hair became matted dead black strands. Her spine popped and protruded through her upper back, forcing her upper body to bend until she was on all fours. Her previously soothing voice was replaced by something that was discordant, high and low-pitched at the same time, seemingly moaning, screaming, and growling at the same time. My will left me. The creature continued its unsettling vocalization. The ground around it was torn as soil and grass flew from its fitful transformation. With a final moan, it finally stopped, 
moving and looking up at me with dark eyes peering through that matted hair. It grinned. At that moment, it lunged as the ibis squawked above me, which tore me from my daze. I dove to the side, and as soon as I hit the ground, I was up and running, sprinting in the opposite direction. I frantically looked for the shotgun as Ibis scattered in every direction, shrieking and flapping. There, I saw it through the flapping of black wings. It was there in the grass, but I had no time to spare. She was unleashing her unearthly call behind me. I sprinted towards the gun and dove towards it as the creature simultaneously leapt towards me, but sailed overhead as I dove under it. I grabbed the shotgun and took off running through the trees with the creature close behind me. My chest was burning and my breath came in sobs. The creature sounded triumphant as it screamed to the sky. As I ran, I opened the barrels and swore when I realized that there were no shells in the barrels and the ones I had with me had been lost during the chaos. I threw the gun away and sprinted farther into the trees. I tried to put as many trees between myself and the creature as possible to break its line of sight. Its calls became fainter as I found a tree to hide behind and catch my breath. I sat there, breathing heavily, and suddenly it dawned on me with a sinking dread. I was the prey. I felt cold sweats as I heard its distant vocalization. Prey behavior. That is what was going to save my life. All my knowledge was going to determine my fate. Refocusing, I looked behind me and saw that my trail through the trees was pretty clear. I swore silently and saw movement between the trees. A glint of black eyes, pallid skin, a stretched smile. I ripped my gaze away and found the nearest tree, climbing into it and tearing the skin on my hands as I climbed. I reached the top of the tree, huddling in the foliage. I had to cover my mouth to stifle the sobs and gasps for air. A couple minutes passed in silence. Suddenly, I looked up into the branches and saw a dove, the first one that I had seen since this morning. It was huddled as close as it could get to the trunk of the tree, and its unblinking eyes were fixed somewhere in the direction from which I had come. I stared at it with dawning realization. I hadn't seen this dove, or any other for that matter, as I walked through the trees, until I came across the ibis. If I couldn't see the birds in the trees, then maybe this thing wouldn't see me. I grasped the trunk and held my breath. That's when I heard it, shuffling and dragging through the dead leaves and black hair littered with filth. A low, warbling hum was emanating from the creature. It resonated in my chest, and I felt that this low-frequency sound was going to expose me. The creature continued disjointedly ambling with its head swaying back and forth, searching. I don't know how much longer I could hold on. Tears were streaming down my face, and it was everything I could do to stop myself from crying out or gasping for air. The creature continued this sound and turned its head. It was angled away from me, listening. I saw the corner of its mouth rise in another horrifying grin. It moved out of sight. And then, there was silence. The same, awful, deathly silence. The creature was nowhere to be seen. I remembered the quail in those cold woods so many years ago. Their panic was their downfall, but the silence was pressing on. I felt the urge to jump, to flee... Just as I thought I was going to lose my composure and scream, a dove burst from a nearby tree, darting and weaving through the trees. The creature vocalized its discordant call and it galloped after the panicked bird. After the footfalls had faded to silence, I let out a gasp and gulped in air as I shakily wiped the sweat from my face. I began my descent through the branches and looked one more time up at the trembling dove perched in the tree. I broke my gaze and began my sprint through the trees, silence but for my racing footsteps through the leaves. The creature was somewhere in those rows of trees, waiting. Then I heard it again, that cry. I picked up my pace as I saw something pale loping through the trees, like a dog running through tall grass. 
The sight was enough to break me, but adrenaline pushed my body to move as fast as I could. I saw a flash of reflected sunlight through the trees. It was the reflection of a pond. I didn't know what else to do. I ran straight for the pond, noticing the reeds and heavy brush that sprouted up from the water. I grabbed a handful of brush and covered my tracks the best that I could, shakily brushing the ground. I slipped into the cold water and it clawed at my chest as I gasped. I embraced myself in the thick reeds and sat still, already shivering from the fear and the penetrating cold. The galloping footsteps came closer and the creature appeared at the edge of the pond. It was low to the ground, crawling along the bank. I looked down at my shaking hands and my heart dropped. Blood. I was bleeding from the tree that I had climbed. Without moving my body, my eyes tracked the creature's movement. It was staring at something on the ground. As I watched in repulsion, a thick, grotesque tongue emerged from its maw, and it dragged it across the ground. I closed my eyes and huddled into the reeds. Did it know where I was? Was it toying with me? I opened my eyes and the creature was gone. For the first time, I looked around. Through a gap in the trees, I could see my truck. I wanted to make a break for it, but I had no idea where the creature was. That's when I heard the rustling in the treetops. Between the dark foliage, I could see glimpses of that skin like sour milk. It was stalking me. It knew I was close. The foliage rustled once more, and then it was still. Minutes passed, and then an hour. My muscles ached, and I felt drained. There was no denying my situation. The creature knew I was close, and it was only a matter of time before it flushed me from hiding. Then, the voice. Don't go, my love. We could have so much fun together. I want you. I need you. I saw a glitter of black eyes like chiseled flint. I clenched my fists and looked towards my truck. If I was going to run, it was going to be on my terms, not when that thing found me. Then I heard another voice, a male. Hey, is someone out there? I saw your truck. I jumped with a start. And before I could stop myself, I broke for the bank and yelled, Yes, I'm here! I'm in the- And I cut myself short as I realized my mistake. The creature leapt silently from a tree and stood at its full, formidable height. I backed away slowly, shaking at the nightmare that stood before me. Without taking its eyes off me, it began to bob and jerk in a mechanical motion. It was moving imperceptibly closer to me, all the while swaying, rolling, leaping, and bobbing. I was transfixed by its unnatural movements, and I felt like I could neither fight nor run. My limbs refused to obey me as my mind floundered with thoughts, none of which I could focus on. It got closer yet, still grinning at me with a mouth that seemed to be nothing but sharpened teeth jutting out from stretched lips. It crouched within arm length of me, and it extended its face toward me from its crouched position. It inhaled deeply through its nostrils and shook slightly as it exhaled with an excited whimper. The eyes rolled back into its head with unrestrained glee. The massive tongue flopped from its maw, and it grabbed my bleeding hand with a vice-like grip. I fell to my knees as its grip forced me to the ground. The tongue wrapped around my hand, slurping and lapping at the wound. I couldn't avert my horrified eyes as its breathing grew quicker and heavier. The tongue retracted back almost unwillingly, and it refocused on me. It flung me into the pond with contempt, and I hit the water. Before I could orient myself, it was upon me, and I flailed, trying to reach the surface. I opened my eyes underwater and came face to face with it, inches away. Its hair flowed like a billowing dark cloud. It screamed in my face, and bubbles obscured my vision. With panic filling me, I lashed out and caught it in the stomach with one of my flailing feet, pushing it away. I seized the moment to push off from the ground and broke the surface with a gasp. I desperately swam for shore, not looking back to see if it was following. 
I clambered into the slick bank and then felt that iron grip clasp my ankle. I looked back and saw its head half submerged in water and black hair spread across the surface. The grip clamped harder and blood mixed with the mud and water as claws sank into my flesh. I screamed and blindly lashed out with my free leg, trying to dislodge it. It only dug deeper and screamed. One of my kicks landed, and it loosened its grip enough for me to make it onto the muddy bank, and slipping and sliding, I made a hobbled sprint for the truck. I gritted my teeth and broke through the tree line. I reached the truck door and ripped it open as I clambered inside. I slammed the door shut just as the creature burst forth from the trees, loping towards me. I turned the engine over, putting the truck in first and dropped the clutch as I shot forward with dust boiling up behind me. It kept pace, lashing out its long arms against the truck until I punched the truck into second gear and sped away, leaving it behind in the dust. As the dust obscured the creature, I saw the silhouette change to that of a woman. She didn't move as I lost sight of her in the rearview mirror, now going sixty miles an hour down the dirt road. After I'd put a few miles between myself and the creature, I skidded to a halt, not even bothering to engage the clutch, killing the engine and bringing it to a halt. A mixture of relief, dread, and fear washed over me, and my head hit the steering wheel as I sobbed. I couldn't process the events, and I could do nothing but weep. I didn't try to understand or make sense of it. I let it wash over me. I sat. Stunned and shaking as my brain finally realized that I was safe. I looked up towards the horizon with a shaky breath. I started my truck again and made the journey home, leaving the danger behind, but not the horror that I experienced. I don't hunt anymore. The joy and peace I experienced from being in nature was extinguished. My pride I once found in bracing myself against the brutality of the world was dashed and irreclaimable. That part of me was beaten into submission and left to lie in a dark corner of my soul, never again to see the light of day. The beauty I once found is now refuted by the monstrosity that lurked in the trees. Everything I thought I knew about the world had been flipped upside down until I didn't know what to believe. I wrestled with the existence of that creature. I couldn't believe that such a creature could be created by the same thing that created black and white duck. The contradiction drove me to madness. No, I was looking at it all wrong. It was always there, I just didn't realize it. Nothing had changed. These circumstances didn't change the way the world worked, the brutality of it. I was a monster. I always had been. But now I know, I am not the only monster that stalks the earth. I need to get this information off my chest. I'm riding this on the shoulder of the highway in Utah. It's 4 a.m. and I've been driving non-stop for almost two hours. I don't know if you've ever been to Utah, but it gets pitch black at night. Nothing exists beyond the high beams of my car. Well, at least from what I can perceive. I know something is out there, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I was backpacking through Zion National Park, this fantastic place where the canyon walls are a deep sunset red and pine trees grow straight out of the rocks. Even in my delirium, I can still appreciate the beauty of it. My trip wasn't anything serious, just a three-day turnaround trip spanning around 30 miles in total. I don't see that many people around this time of year, aside from the occasional day hiker. Most tend to stay out during the winter due to cold weather, snow, and the risk of flash floods brought on from the rainy season. I, however, thrive in isolation. The fewer people around make it easier for me to appreciate the park and all its natural beauty. For the uninitiated, backpacking is a challenging activity that most people don't dare to try, which is unfortunate. I feel like people come the most alive when they push themselves to do these kinds of things. And as cheesy as it sounds, you really do experience some magic when you're this far removed from the city and our modern luxuries. 
I could go on about the ecosystems that have never encountered human contact and how it feels to step into a truly wild world, but I'd be talking out of my ass. Because after today, I realized I genuinely have no idea of what lives in those woods, or any area not lived in by people. It was my second night, after two long days of walking in a straight line and slowly pacing myself and exploring, I set up my tent and got ready to hurry back to my car. As much as I love the outdoors, nothing can compete with the sensation of hot, fast food after several days of roughing it. As I ate my military rations, I was already imagining the cheeseburgers I'd be eating the following day. Over the last two days, I walked about 15 miles into the park, covering about 7 miles a day with my heavy bag. I'll be the first to tell you how important it is not to overpack for trips like these. Every pound makes a difference when you're carrying it through the brush. Even short excursions can be challenging if your bag is too heavy. Fortunately, I learned from my previous trip and kept my pack to around 35 pounds. After my meal of powdered lasagna and a candy bar was finished, I poked at the hot coals in my makeshift fire pit. I also packed a camp stove to cook with, but when you go camping, you have to make a campfire. It's an unofficial rule that everyone follows. There's something about being in the wilderness at night that triggers a subconscious instinct in us to build a fire and illuminate the dark. Our ancestors used this instinct daily to survive, and it became embedded in our DNA. Tonight, this instinct kept me alive. As my fire began to shrink, my desire for sleep began to increase. When you're in the woods with no technology, the oppressive darkness brought on by night naturally makes you drowsy. I was getting ready to stand up and put out my fire when I suddenly noticed the sensation that I was being watched. The feeling washed over me, and after identifying it, I realized there were no sounds in the woods around me. Even in winter, you can hear noises from the non-hibernating critters but all I could hear was the wind rustling through the trees above me and see the gaps between branches barely illuminated by the light of a crescent moon. At the time, it felt like a better idea to build my fire back up. I could always put it out later, after all, and this was my last night in the woods, so I could spare using extra materials. As I put my remaining wood in the fire, I thought I heard something in the tree line. I had set up my tent in a small clearing, no larger than fifteen feet. It was just big enough for me to put my tent in the center and have about ten feet on all sides. So, whatever I was hearing was incredibly close to me, and even with my medium-sized campfire, I couldn't see anything outside of the clearing. A couple of times I heard rustling in the leaves, and I shined my spotlight in the direction of the noise. But all I would ever see were the same piles of dead leaves that cover the forest floor everywhere else in the winter. I didn't smell blood or rot or anything you usually read about in ghost stories. I genuinely had no idea at all what was moving around my camp. And I think that was more unnerving. I just know that something was circling my shelter, but wouldn't walk into the clearing. Now, this isn't entirely unexpected, after all. Zion is home to many different species of animals, including coyotes, foxes, and mountain lions. My worst fear at this moment would be to have a cougar in my camp. Not the fun kind in this case. I sat back in front of the fire after patrolling my site's perimeter and found a red flower right in front of where I sat before. Now, I know this may seem insignificant to the uninitiated, but... Finding a flower like this in the middle of January was entirely out of place. And stranger still, I had no memory of seeing this flower from the previous three hours of sitting by the fire. I studied it closely, noting that it was indeed rooted to the earth. It hadn't been placed on the ground. It, it must have already been there. And I just didn't notice. I picked it and realized I didn't recognize the species. I'm no expert on the flora and fauna of Zion, but I haven't seen a plant like this anywhere before. I washed out the bag my MRE came in and placed the flower inside, to take home and look up on the internet. I was sure somebody on Reddit would be able to identify it. With no other oddities, I eventually gave in to my exhaustion and went to sleep. I know you're not supposed to, but 
I let my fire burn out on its own. It was low enough I didn't think it would be a hazard, uh, but the soft glow gave me a feeling of security to sleep. I must have been asleep for about an hour before I woke up to the feeling of something large moving under my tent. The best way I can describe it is to imagine if a large snake slithered under your sheets in bed as you laid down on top of it. It was so unnatural I shot up awake immediately, and still trapped in my sleeping bag, I fell over in the process of my escape. Turning on my light and aiming it at the floor revealed that something was moving under the thin material of my tent's floor, inspecting the warm spot where I was sleeping. My mind was racing as I began to theorize what it could possibly be. Maybe it was a skunk that was getting too nosy for its own good, or maybe it really was a snake. But I couldn't think of a species of snake in Utah that could be thicker than my arm. Also, again, snakes aren't usually active in the middle of winter, especially in the dark of night. The fear of the unknown propelled me out of my tent, with just enough clarity for me to grab my bag and step into the clearing. I can't describe the feeling of confusion and dread that overcame me when I saw a ring of those damn red flowers completely circled around my tent. They were all planted in the ground the same as the first, but formed a perfect circle that nature could not produce so accurately by itself. Without any warning, I heard the sound of fabric tearing apart, followed by the sounds of something desperately clawing at my tent, and what I can only describe as an unimaginably deep, reverberating, groaning sound. It didn't sound natural. It sounded more like a low frequency you'd hear if you turned the bass on your car all the way up, and amplified that several times. It was more than just a sound. It reverberated in my insides and made me feel nauseous. Then, illuminated by my spotlight, I saw a massive arm shoot out from the top of my tent, an inhuman appendage with odd-numbered digits and skin that more resembles tree bark than flesh. The demon limb pulled my entire tent under the earth in one swift move, leaving behind a crumbled mess of dirt, but leaving the flowers undisturbed. I was shocked. I couldn't move. Hell, I couldn't even process what happened. Nothing in my wildest dreams could prepare me for what I could only describe as a shark pulling my shelter under the compact soil like it was water. I stood there for what felt like hours, but in reality it was only a few moments. I felt that frequency again. From below the earth, it sounded frustrated, like I didn't get what it was after. I finally found my courage and ran from that spot. I lost some supplies that I had left inside my tent and around my campsite, but I couldn't care less at the moment. I just ran through the brush with my lights trembling in my hand. I was constantly bumping into trees and grazing my legs on the thorny bushes, but the only thing on my mind was survival. Fight or flight is another instinct we inherit from our ancestors, the primal knowledge when we know we're up against something out of our league. I continued to hear the shifting of leaves behind me, but no matter where I shined my light, I saw nothing chasing me. I would gladly take a cougar at this point. At least I could identify the threat and could know how to handle it. Then, at the last moment, I caught a glimpse of another one of those damn red flowers right in the middle of my path. I barely noticed it before I stepped on it by accident. As I said, it was right smack dab in my path almost deliberately placed. The second my foot came into contact with it, I felt the earth shift under my weight. I lost my balance and fell face first onto the ground. I broke my nose in the process, but I didn't get the chance to appreciate the pain before that same arm wrapped its fingers around my boot. I don't think fingers is an accurate description. They were more like roots from a tree long and gnarly and extending across my foot and up my leg. I released my boot from myself and propelled myself away from the crater. The arm whipped back into the ground, taking its prized boot under the dirt with it. Despite the discomfort of only wearing one boot, I continued to run, bloodying my unprotected foot but not caring about the pain. Survival was the only thing on my mind. I started throwing things out of my pack to make travel a little easier. 
I had dropped about ten pounds of gear when I found the bag with the red flower in it. I remembered how the thing attacked me when I stepped on the red flower. Was this thing tracking me because I took the flower? But my curiosity wasn't worth being pulled beneath the earth. I took the flower out of the bag and threw it behind me in the direction of the noise of churning dirt. Before it even hit the ground, the same arm shot out of the dirt and caught it. To my surprise, it caught the flower with a tender, open palm, not crushing the flower. A second arm emerged from the ground, followed by a third and a fourth, until there were no more arms to count in the darkness. Then, what I perceived to be the creature's head rose from the center. I say, perceived, because it didn't have a face or anything I would recognize as a face. But it was in the center of its bulky mass, and the hand with the flower was raised in front of it. In complete contrast to its behavior up until now, it delicately nurtured the flower, applying some kind of ointment to the bottom of the stem where I had cut it out and planted it in the ground. Its low frequency now resembled the cooing of a mourning dove, still as deep as before, but anger replaced by something else. At this point I began to back away from this creature. I stepped on a dead tree branch, and it snapped its head in my direction, but turned back to its precious flower. I ran for hours until I reached my car. I'd never been so relieved to find my beaten-up pickup in my life. As I pulled out of the woods and into the main park road, I noticed a couple of red flowers along the side of the road. I made note to steer clear of them. I now know what happens if you mess with this creature's prized flowers. Looking at the clock, it was 2 a.m. The sun must have set around 5 p.m. the day before. I had covered 15 miles on foot in that time, and I was still on edge. The ranger station was closed for the night. The lights on the building turned off as I sped by. I stopped my car because my engine is running hot after pushing it so hard for the last couple of hours. I'm taking a break from camping for now. I love the outdoors, but seriously need to reconsider what threats live just out of sight of man. I'm not entirely sure what I saw tonight, but if you go camping, do not take anything that doesn't belong to you, and always listen to your instincts. Mine kept me alive today. We have them for a reason. It started when I thought I saw something in the corner of my bedroom. And then, on the fourth night, I knew I did. I woke up suddenly at 3 a.m., my heart racing and sweat beating along my hairline. I had just had a nightmare, though I was already forgetting what it was about. All I could remember was the feeling of being chased, and the feeling of the tingle on the back of my neck, like something was reaching out to grab me. My breath evened, and my hand stopped shaking as I sat in bed, my body relaxing as it tried to slip back into sleep. And that's when I saw it. A pale face in the corner of my room, lurking where the shadows gathered, body looming toward the ceiling, and reaching almost the same height. It was obviously inhuman. It wasn't the normal shape of a person, and its face was bright, almost luminescent. It stood there, silently, no huff of breath, no rising and falling of its chest. If I hadn't been staring at it, I'd never have known it was there. I was too scared to move, too scared to turn on the light, to get out of bed, to do anything other than slip back under the covers and pretend I had never seen it. I tucked the duvet up to my chin and stared out the window, feeling very much like I had when I was five and I was convinced there was a monster in my closet. I kept watch of it out of the corner of my eye for the rest of the night. When my room began to brighten from pre-dawn light, the creature began to fade, like it lost opacity when the shadows that cloaked it dissipated. My alarm woke me up maybe an hour later, and I managed to convince myself it was a dream. Isn't that what we all do when we're scared? Try to rationalize what terrifies us? Ground it into something tangible? Something able to be overcome? That's what I did. All day at work, as I yawned over and over inside my cubicle, I pretended that what I had seen wasn't real. 
I was just tired. It was that nightmare, blending into my waking life. Everything would return to normal when I went to bed. I prepared for bed and crawled under my duvet that night, welcoming the embrace of my warm sheets after an exhausting day. I reached over to turn off my bedside lamp, and I hesitated. My hand shook as the fear inched its way throughout my body. I shook my head, tried to clear it, and told myself I was being stupid, that these were the fears of a child, not a grown man. I clicked the light off. I looked in the corner. There was nothing there. I dropped back into my pillows in relief and laughed at myself for how ridiculous I had been. I fell asleep quickly. I woke up at 3 a.m. again. The sheets below me drenched in sweat. I had kicked the bed covers down to my feet and I felt that same feeling in the back of my neck. I bit back a scream when I looked in the corner of my room. The thing was there again, watching me. Still, a silent, no sound, no movement. This time, I didn't pretend not to notice. What do you want? It didn't speak. It didn't reply. It just kept staring at me, its white face still. We stayed as we were for the rest of the night. And when the dawn rolled in, its form became translucent again. Gradually, as the sun crested over the horizon and lit up my bedroom. I slept on my couch the next night, with the lights on, the TV on, everything on, to make it feel like I wasn't alone. I was hoping that, whatever that thing was, it only inhabited my bedroom. I was hoping it would leave me be if I stayed downstairs. I was wrong. I woke up with a start and immediately saw the thing in the corner next to my entertainment center. I wish I had kept the lights off. It was tall, much taller than I thought before, its head grazing the ceiling, its neck bent at a 90 degree angle, eyes wide and bloodshot, mouth agape and lips blue. But it didn't move. It just stood there, watching me. I didn't sleep with the lights on after that. The next night, I couldn't fall asleep. I wouldn't allow myself to. I lay there in the dark, facing the thing, trying not to stare into its eerie, pale face. I felt my body as it tried to force me to sleep. I kept my eyes open, made up riddles in my head to keep my mind occupied. I couldn't trust this thing not to hurt me. It hadn't done anything so far, but who's to say it would remain that way? I heard it move then. It was the only sound I'd ever heard it make. Just a slight shuffle, a stirring in the breeze. I glanced at it out of the corner of my eye and saw that it had moved closer. Just a step. I didn't wait to see what it would do. I threw the covers off and ran down the stairs, grabbing my keys from the table by the door as I went. I slammed the door behind me, not bothering to lock it. I got into my car and shoved the keys into the ignition my engine roaring to life as I hastily started it. As I pulled out of my driveway, I saw the thing standing in my bedroom window, its head bent and arm outstretched as it watched me drive away. I drove around all night, waiting for nine when I had to be at work. I bought some toothpaste from a drugstore and changed into the spare work clothes I kept inside my trunk. I ran my hands through my hair to try to flatten the mess on top of my head. But there was nothing to be done about that. I walked inside work, looking as disheveled as I felt. Dude, you look like shit, Mark said. Thanks, man. I fell into my chair inside our joint cubicle and took a few glugs of my coffee. Not sleeping for a few nights in a row was really starting to take its toll. You alright? Mark said. He looked concerned, his eyebrow drawn in sympathy. Sure, I said. I haven't been sleeping much. I paused and then spoke again. Actually, can I sleep at yours tonight? I think I need a change of scenery or something. Yeah, of course. You know you're welcome anytime, Mark said. I nodded and thanked him again. The day dragged by with me taking a nap in my car for lunch, but I was hopeful for the first time that week. 
As far as I knew, that thing was only tied to my house. I'd never seen it anywhere else. Maybe I'd be able to get some sleep tonight. Mark set me up on the futon in his living room. He was in his 30s, but he furnished his house like a broke college student. Bare walls, cheap, probably used couch, and one plate in the cabinet. It wasn't really any wonder that he was still a bachelor. Mark handed me the remote to the TV and turned off the light in the living room. Take anything you want, he said. He shut his bedroom door softly, and I could hear the clacking of the keys on his keyboard as he did whatever he does at night. I didn't care. I just wanted to sleep. I fell off pretty quickly. Mark's scratchy blanket itching my skin while some shitty late night reality TV played in the background. I woke up in my bed. What the fuck? I said out loud and sat up. I laid on top of my covers with my shoes on and keys in my hand. Had I driven myself home? I didn't remember doing that. How did I get into the car and drive back here without remembering any of it? The thing was watching me. It stood in front of my window, backlit by the moonlight streaming in through the curtains. I threw a pillow at it. What do you want? I screamed. Just leave me alone. And, as always, the thing didn't move, didn't speak. It just stared at me, as immobile as ever. I felt hopeless, terrified. After that night, I knew I wouldn't be able to leave. I'd have to stay here, night after night, wondering what that thing would do once it reached me. Because it would reach me. It kept getting closer, taking small steps forward, until, after a few weeks, it was right up to my bed, looming over me as I lay there, stiff with fear. And every night, I never slept. Last night was the worst. I faced away from the thing this time, as I had started doing, so that I wouldn't have to see its face. I heard it move, the slight rustle, the quiet stirring as it came closer. It still confused me how something that felt so malevolent could sound so gentle. But it was different this time. Before, I'd only ever seen it, or heard it. But this time, I felt it. My bed creaked as the weight of the thing pressed against my mattress as it decided to join me. My breath shuddered and my body rolled back toward the thing. I scooted forward to the other side of the bed. I tried not to cry. I don't know what to do. I don't know who to call. I can't leave. I can't stay anywhere else. I can't go to a friend's. I can't stay at a motel. I always end up here. In this bed. With the thing watching me from a station in the corner, its face pale in the moonlight, not making a sound as it steps toward me while I sleep.